if you are still in the eh, it's not a mini it's too big camp then look away now because we are about to unleash a beast in the northeast grr yep this thing is enormous and if you're still in the eh, it's not mini it's not british <laughs> camp then look away again because big mini here is as bmw is tailgating in the outside lane or wearing sunglasses when it's cloudy and while that might make you angry because who among us doesn't yearn for the good old days when if you're over six foot you couldn't actually fit into a car and those who could might be killed in a 20 miles per hour pran it does mean that Big Mini is quantifiably excellent. There are many ways in which Big Mini here is one of the very best family crossover type things that you can buy. And they're mostly down to it being large and German. So let's go through those. For a start, the ostensible quality is solid. And while you might hate the way it's designed, and there is a legitimate argument to be had about mini cabin design not really moving forward in almost 20 years, you must at least concede that it is nice and idiosyncratic. And it is that while making sense, a hard balancing act to achieve, which you'll know if you've ever tried to find the electric window switch in a DS5 or a Lamborghini. And who among us hasn't owned one of those two cars at some point in life, right? Big Mini achieves another neat balancing trick by feeling compact when you're driving it, but actually being a very serviceable family car. Yeah, I know that for a Mini it's massive, but actually for a family crossover, it's on the small side. Take a classic crossover, this and Qashqai say, and compare dimensions and you'll see that the Mini is shorter and lower. But the Mini has the longer wheelbase of the two, so it's got plenty of leg room and it helps in the handling stakes too. Because even the lordiest Mini has to conform passably with the company's whole go-kart handling shtick. <laughs> Plenty of family crossovers handle well, but this one feels the heftiest on the road. Steering's heavy and the car doesn't really roll much at all. You also sit more hunkered down than you do in most crossovers. But that's a double-edged sword because it also means that this is one of the less comfortable crossovers during the majority of the activities that you'll do with it. I.e. not driving it like a complete maniac on a so-called B-road of the type that motoring journalists mythologize. But not me. There are two reasons for that. The first and most obvious is that everything just feels a bit stiff and non-relaxing. Firm damping and firm steering. And secondly, the chairs are kind of small. It's like they've been designed to look good rather than be ergonomically optimal. But none of that is catastrophic. We're talking degrees of discomfort here. And in fact, there's plenty more about Big Mini that makes it brilliant for day-to-day -day driving. Like how the pillars are dead thin, so visibility is optimal. And because it's more driver focused, so to speak, it feels manageable around town. Easy to place, easy to park, stuff like that. More like driving a small hatchback than a lumbering big SUV. Big boot too, relatively. It's much bigger than the last Countryman's and the rear bench has a 40-20-40 split as standard, which is very useful. And it's five star safe. And the engine range is fantastic by virtue of being from BMW stock. It'll all be familiar to you if you know anything about minis. You know, Cooper, Cooper D, Cooper S, Cooper SD and JCW. Usefully, they all come with an auto option and or four wheel drive. And they really are all good. The three cylinder in the Cooper is a particular favorite because what it lacks in power, it makes up for with character. And regardless of whether yours is a front wheel or a four wheel drive one, it'll have the same sort a sharp turning, predictable feel through the tires, and one of the best manual gearboxes in the business. But away from that and onto the more important mundanities of cost and kit, you'll probably also know that Mini is the master of sucking you in with a low list price and good residuals and then beating you across the face with an options list. So like when you buy a packet of crisps and it's got just 99 calories emblazoned across the front of the packet, and then you realize later that that's per portion, and a portion's like, three crisps. Yes, I'm still angry about it, but I ate like a week's calories in half an hour. So your Cooper looks well equipped. It has alloys and parking sensors and dab and stuff like that. And at this price, it does look a little on the high side, but not by too much. However, you look at some of the more popular stuff in the family crossover segment and the Mini does start to look very expensive. And that's before you've got to work on the aforementioned options list. Because let's be honest, nobody's buying one of these on 16 inch wheels, are they? Well, nobody wants to anyway. 
So you take a couple of options packs and then before you know it, you're in a car that's approaching 30 grand. And you know, if that was the end, it would be fair enough. In conclusion, lovely to drive, very different, well made, surprisingly practical, a little bit uncomfortable and a little bit uncomfortably expensive. Oh, and it has a horribly vexing sat nav and infotainment system because I drive still sucks. Classic BMW era mini, but a bit bigger. Worth buying if you want something a bit different and you're willing to pay for it. The end, thanks for watching. But that's not it, because what we have here is the FEV one, the plug-in hybrid electric vehicle, that is. So unusually, this has been my car for the last six months. I've been running it as a long-termer, which you can read all about by going to the Our Cars section of the Honest John website. I'll put a link somewhere. So I feel quite qualified to talk about what it's like actually running one of these things in two long words, disappointingly inefficient, or three short ones. Big fat liar. The official stats for this plug-in hybrid are here. And yes, that does actually say that. It uses the three-cylinder petrol engine from the Cooper to drive the front wheels, and then the rear wheels are driven by an electric motor, and they can work alone or together. Together, they make Big Mini here proper quick, which is why it's called Cooper SE Hybrid, I think. And unlike most plug-in electric hybrids, it's not saddled with a horrible CVT gearbox. More like a hot hatch with a massive electric turbo. It'll also do zero emissions electric driving right up to motorway speed, about 20 miles worth of the battery's full. So if you live close to work and you can keep it charged overnight, then theoretically you never need to dip into the tank. Oh, and you also rear wheel drive. Making this the only car in the world, I think, that can be both front wheel and rear wheel drive separately. You don't care about that, do you? Anyway, the reality of owning this, it transpires, is very, very different to the on-paper utopia. Why? Because once the battery runs out, which it does very quickly, especially if it's cold, then you're basically just dragging along a massive battery and electric motor with your three-cylinder petrol engine. And that means that this is dreadfully inefficient on the motorway. Honestly, you'll be lucky to scrape 30 miles per gallon, which is the opposite of most cars, which tend to get better on the motorway. The upshot is that in six months with this thing, I've averaged about 50 miles per gallon. Now, that's not bad in any other circumstance, but in this thing, the fuel tank is tiny, so I'm always filling it up, which is annoying. But more importantly than that, its list price with options is 44,000 pounds. Yep, 44 grand for a Mini that doesn't work properly on the motorway. Now, and that's not just because of the 30 miles per gallon thing, it's because it's not that comfortable as you can see, it kind of rattles around quite a lot. And if yours has got a panoramic sunroof like this one has, then above about 60 miles an hour, it will suffer from the most annoying wind noise you've ever heard. It's like driving the table at the nutty professor's house. You want your colon clean? Man, I'm gonna clean mine. Now there is a tax argument for this if you're a company car driver and we go through that on the website if you want to check it out. But for a private buyer, it's an absolute non-starter. And for me, it's the perfect example of why the sooner we skip this whole hybrid thing and move on to actual electric cars with reasonable ranges that people can use, the better. So in second conclusion, most of the big mini range, good, different, etc. The plug-in one though, nah. Thanks for watching. Please comment and subscribe and share it. And I'll see you soon. Jordy Jesus, out.